Let's talk about the book fair. We're here at the book fair. Uh, why do a Jewish book fair here, and what's its significance? You know, Los Angeles, as you know, Jay, is the second largest Jewish community in the United States, and for some reason, although there have been attempts, fits and starts, about trying to have some kind of a Jewish book fair, no institution has really gotten it together to have a sustained event that the Jewish community can rely on having every year, and that's really our goal. Uh, this is the first of what I hope is going to be an annual event for the American Jewish community, or at least for the Los Angeles part of the American Jewish community. Uh, we didn't luck out with the weather today, but we had over 3,000 people here, which is a wonderful start for us. Uh, why do we do it? Because we want to uh, interest American Jews, and particularly the group in Los Angeles, uh, in, in reading Jewish books. When you look at the Jewish population study, it's surprising, actually, how many American Jews tell you that they may not do anything else, but they read Jewish books. But part of it is making that possible for them to do it. So to have this kind of an event where we have so many Jewish authors, uh, some writing specifically about Jewish topics, others not necessarily writing about Jewish topics, uh, it introduces them to a whole new world. Plus, we had uh, cooperation with Borders, and they came and created a, a bookstore uh, for everybody who was here. So people were encountering titles that they probably never heard of before and taking them home and reading them. Let's go macro, bigger. Recently, the name of this institution changed from the University of Judaism, which, by the way, is still on the freeway, so uh -huh. you know, it's a little confusing. No, we said to check into those people, so we we're hoping that the sense of the change. Okay, to the American Jewish University. Mm -hmm. So my first question is, in changing the name, why American Jewish University, and what does the name mean in terms of the changing and the evolution of the institution? When I grew up, and I grew up in L.A., you know, I knew the name UJ, I knew the University of Judaism, and I have a sentimental attachment. Uh, when I was at UCLA, I took classes here. I began my rabbinic training here. So clearly I had a sentimental connection to that name. But my job as president is not to focus on my sentimental attachments, but to think about where we're trying to go institutionally and what signals who we are as an institution. So here we had this a remarkable opportunity uh, to unite with uh, Brandeis Bardeen Institute to create a larger a Jewish institution, I think even more than just the sum of the parts. And so there were a couple of reasons why we changed the name. One is that we didn't feel that either institution should go forward with their name. So neither the Brandeis Bardeen name nor the University of Judaism name. We needed a new name that would indicate a new future for this joint institution. And so we came up with the American Jewish University. But there's another reason. Uh, University of Judaism, as much as I may have a sentimental connection to the name, it's a fairly religious sounding name. It's a little offbeat. I try to imagine if I heard for the first time something called the University of Buddhism or the University of Christianity, how I might react. And the truth is I wouldn't react positively. I'd figure it was some kind of fringy uh, institution, certainly not anything where I would find something. And, and that's what the reaction we get to University of Judaism when people hear it for the first time. It's also an impediment to uh, undergraduates. Uh, the undergraduates who come here are primarily Jewish, and they're here because they want to be at a Jewish institution. But you don't want to hit them over the head with it. You have a place called the University of Judaism, and in their minds they see rabbis with long beards running around the halls. So American Jewish University really gets the message across. Jewish is there, squarely, but it's Jewish that represents more Jewish civilization and all of its aspects, rather than Judaism, which only represents the religion, and American because that's the task of all of us here as Jews which is to find a safe and, and good meeting place between our Americanism and our Judaism. And so in changing the name, I'm, I'm assuming the, the, you're also evolving what the mission is of, of, the, of, of the university. How is that changing in, in your mind? Well, we're actually now in a process of thinking that, that through. As you can imagine, when the merger was announced, there are a lot of people who came forward with ideas, some old ideas, some new ideas about how we might use this new institution in ways that we haven't thought of in the, in the past. The problem is I don't want to take any one of those and jump on it and start to go down the road only to find out that there was a better idea yet we've already committed to something. So we're trying to take a step back and use the next few months, now the beginning of this academic year, to think more strategically about where we'd like to, where we'd like to go. But there are some areas that we've identified already that I think are in one form or another going to find their way onto our, our map. Uh, one has to do with our connection with the community of intermarried Jews. Again, I'm going to refer to the 2000 Jewish population study. When they asked 18 to 25 year olds about their parents, fewer than 50 percent of the 18 to 25 year olds who, about, who said about themselves, I'm a Jew, have two born Jewish parents. So that means that, that most young American Jews, and I have to assume that was seven years ago, it's even more so now. Absolutely. Most young American Jews are living in a household where one of their two parents was not born Jewish. Now, that one parent may have converted to Judaism or may not, 
have converted to Judaism. But what it says is, is that there's been a tremendous shift in the nature of the American Jewish family in which kids who see themselves as Jews are being raised. That same statistic, when you ask people over 30, 70% of them said they have two born Jewish parents. From 70 down to 48, and all you really did was go down about 10 years, 10 or 20 years in an age cohort. So what does that say to me? What it says to me is, is that we have to be looking more carefully at the intermarried Jewish family and understand what our relationship is going to be. It's a difficult uh, topic for a lot of Jews because when you talk about the notion of someone Jewish marrying out of the Jewish faith, there's a negative association always uh, attached uh, to that. And that's very understandable. We'd like Jews to marry Jews. We'd like the continuity of, of Judaism, which we feel is the easiest when two Jews marry one another. But at some point, you also have to take into account the reality of, of, of what's going on and look at the fact of intermarriage rather as seeing it as some kind of curse, as some kind of challenge, a challenge that is the reality of what the Jewish community is. So trying to interest couples who are intermarried either into the possibility of one, the, the non-Jewish member exploring Judaism, uh, either as something they might make a personal commitment to or trying to raise their children in that, in that way, we have to do something about it. A lot of the programs that are pre-conversion programs, we have a pre-conversion program here. We're not a religious institution. We don't do the conversions, but we do the educational part. But we could be doing a lot more. We don't advertise the program. We don't do a living Judaism component uh, of the program because we only have classrooms here. Now with the Brandeis Bardeen site, think of what we can do in terms of exposing people to what Judaism is and the way it's lived when you're in an, an entirely Jewish environment, whether it's for a weekend, or, or for a week. So that, I think, is going to be a major thrust that we're going to be looking at, at the, um, in the future. Uh, another area that is very, very important to us has to do with Israel education. Everyone's complaining about Israel on campuses. Everyone's complaining about the lack of knowledge uh, of Jewish kids, that they don't really know how to respond to criticisms of Israel when they come to, to campus. Our feeling is, is that the engagement with Jews, Jewish kids has to start earlier. And particularly, we believe that high school is a great age because in high school, they're old enough already to be critical of what they're being taught and to engage the, the very complicated issues that surround modern Israel. But they're also in a place where they're in a structured environment where we can talk to them about Israel in a structured way. And so the idea is to try to work through our school of education to uh, change the emphasis, put a stronger emphasis on the teaching of Israel, particularly in the 12th grade, in Jewish schools and in, in Hebrew high schools. And then what we're thinking seriously of doing is having a culminating experience at Brandeis Bardeen, and here's where the merger makes all of that possible, where we would bring Jewish 12th graders from all over the region, all over from the Western United States, to learn about Israel and also to learn about Israel advocacy on campus by bringing students from all over. So those are just a couple of examples. The grand dream down, down the road is to take our undergraduate program and move it from this campus to the Brandeis Bardeen campus. That would be a whole different way of looking at undergraduate education. So those, very quickly, are just three of the possible things that we should be doing, or we will be doing in the next few years. Now, in the name, there are obviously these two words, American and Jewish, and the Jewish history of this mm -hmm. institution has always been, as we talked about earlier, has always been linked to the conservative movement. Mm -hmm. What's the relationship between American Jewish University and the conservative movement today? The American Jewish University doesn't have a specific uh, connection to any one of the movements at all. Uh, however, and it's an interesting question, when uh, the possibility occurred several years ago of beginning a rabbinical school here, it was very exciting for us because it was the one aspect of Jewish professional training that we weren't doing here. We were training teachers, we were training communal professionals, we had a program, we look at our undergraduate program as a program that trains, if you will, Jewish activists in the future, but not, not the rabbinate. But the challenge is when you do the rabbinate, you can either go one of two ways. You can either say it's going to be a non-denominational rabbinical school, or you have to pick one of the denominations, or if you're lucky, you can, I suppose you could do more than one, but you pick one. I thought about the idea of having a non-denominational rabbinical school, but I'm a very practical fellow. As I look at the way that American Judaism is organized, the religious part of American Judaism, it still falls pretty clearly into the Reform, Conservative, and Orthodox. So given the history of our institution, and given the fact that a pluralistic institution is by its nature middle of the road, it seemed most reasonable to ally that rabbinical school with the conservative movement. Now having done that, of course, for some people, it reinforced a pre-existing uh, image that they already had of our institution from earlier years as being affiliated with the conservative movement. But actually, the rabbinical school represents, I don't know, five, six, seven percent of what we do here at the institution. 
that is absolutely affiliated with the movement. The other 93% of what we do has no particular affiliation. If you look at our adult education program, we have over 12,000 students every year. At least half of them are not only not affiliated with the conservative movement, they're not, they're not synagogue goers uh, altogether. And we're proud of that. I'm not proud of the fact that they're not going to synagogues. I'm proud of the fact that even if they're not going to synagogues, that they, they are people who are interested enough in some aspect of Judaism that they want to explore it with us. Now this is, uh, the more you talk about it, the more complicated it seems to me what this institution is. Because you're doing, you're, and, you're, and you're broadening out to things that don't even necessarily have a, G, a connection to a, a physical space, which is what you just did. You added physical space. So you have a rabbinical school, you have a university, you have an adult education program, you're talking about doing outreach in high school, you have summer camps. Mm -hmm. It's a big institution. How do you, in your role here, keep it all together and, you know, and, 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 and make it move forward? Oh, that, that's, that's actually the easiest question. Hardest thing to do, easiest thing to answer. You find good people to head each of those different areas, and you have to be smart enough uh, not to interfere too much in what they want to do. It is very much like being the, the orchestra leader. You want to make sure that all the different sections, the wind section, the, the string section, they're all playing in the same, the same direction. But the strings still have to do what they have to do, and the winds still have to do, and the percussion still has to do uh, you know, what they want to do. You look at a place like UCLA. You know, it's an institution. Well, what is UCLA? Right away, you would answer, well, it's a place where you get and go and get your undergraduate degree. It's also a place where you get graduate degrees. It's also a major hospital in Los Angeles and a training institution. Uh, it's also a major business in terms of the student store and all the things. It's a sports facility. I mean, there, there are so many different dimensions to what a modern university does and what it can mean in the life of a community. And since our, uh, our emblematic or, or a slogan, if you will, is Judaism is a civilization, we try to embrace as much of the civilization as we can. Except, and that's a good analogy, except in the Jewish world, models like this don't exist so easily. So, you know, obviously you, you have intention when, you, when you're doing all this. Are you finding that it's more complicated to do this in the Jewish world? I mean, given, given the fact that this is a, there, aren't very few, there are very few Jewish mergers in terms of community organizations. There should be more, I believe. Um, and there's very, it's very difficult for Jewish organizations to even work together. And here you are creating a, a, mono, a, a huge institution in the Jewish world is that not more challenging? UCLA is, you know, there are multiple UCLA's in the secular world. So you're saying that in UCLA they probably don't meet resistance to the concept? I'm, I'm saying that it, 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 from where I sit, it, it seems more challenging to do something like this in the Jewish world, given the fact that, one, ex institutions like this don't exist, and I think they don't exist for a reason, and, uh, and two, because you are, you are, in a way, treading on many different, in many different areas where there are other institutions. Are you, let me rephrase it, are you finding it more of a challenge to do it now? I, I think at the beginning, you know, everyone likes to be loved by everybody, but at some point you realize that if you're going to stake out new territory, not everybody is going to be excited about what you're going to do. And so you have to decide for yourself, is this really what I believe in? Is this worth making the effort and taking whatever flack I might have to take for, for doing it? For me, the answer is yes. I mean, I think, it's been, I think it's been worthwhile. And I'm very gratified by the number of people who've been very excited about what's happened to American Jewish University over, over the time. Are there some that are not? Absolutely. I wouldn't tell you otherwise. There are people who are nostalgic for what the old UJ was 25 or 30 or even 40 years ago. But you know, the Jewish community is dynamic. It's changing. If you look at the numbers of people who are involved in synagogues, and I wish it were a higher number, but nationwide it's 50 percent. In the western region it's maybe 30 to 35 percent. What about that other 60 to 65 percent, 70 percent of those Jews who are not being served? I'd love to see more of them in, in, in synagogues, but we've got to make sure that other organizations are going to represent that kind of broad umbrella that's going to allow people to, to find their way in and have some kind of meaningful contact with Judaism. So let me ask you some questions about you because it's, sure. you're in a unique situation. You've been at UJ for about since 30 what? years. 30 years. Okay, so you, you, you got a PhD at UCLA mm -hmm. and you got, you, you got uh, your rabbinical training at, at Jewish Jesus. Theological yeah. Seminary. When you were younger, you know, you probably had some dreams and you, you've written some really interesting material on, on the Bible, on immortality, and really interesting subjects. And now you are the CEO mm -hmm. of. Uh, a, a big Jewish business, basically. Yeah, but I, I always, I, that CEO piece was uh, always a little bit in me. I was raised by a businessman. 
So, and, and the likelihood is, had I not gone into the rabbit, and I probably would have gone into some kind of you know, business. I like organizing things. I like taking things and making them, them better. But I had a very eclectic Jewish upbringing. I was brought up in a home, in a very not religious home. Uh, my mother grew up in Los Angeles, never went to synagogue. The family was very proud of being Jewish, but they didn't have very much specific Jewish content to what they did. She wanted us to, my sister and me, to have an education, sent us to Wilshire Boulevard Temple. It was Rabbi Magdan's Wilshire Boulevard Temple, so it was not exactly the bastion of traditional Judaism, but that's how I grew up. Uh, accidentally, it's a long story, but I wound up at an Orthodox day camp while I was going to, uh, to this reform uh, Hebrew school during the week, so I was a little confused. But it sort of all came together, and I sort of became, I guess, on some level, pan-Jewish, which is I'm, I'm a religious Jew. I'm a conservative rabbi by, by training. But I find that as I define myself as a Jew, there isn't just one adjective that I would use. And I, and I think that's really what bothers me about the way that people look at the, the Jewish community, even in the population studies. Immediately, when they want to identify Jews, they go, reform, conservative, orthodox, just Jewish. And you have to find yourself uh, in that. But if I put down conservative as, as my uh, uh, ideological affiliation or my philosophy, that only tells you one small piece of who I am as a Jew. It tells you nothing about what I think about Israel. It tells you nothing about what I think about Jews in other places. It tells you nothing about the pleasure that I derive in reading about Jewish history. It doesn't tell you anything about so many dimensions of my Jewish life. It doesn't tell you about how I feel about Jewish music, a Jewish art, Jewish theater. So I, I'm bothered by the fact that we've sort of slipped into this denominational mold where that becomes the ultimate descriptor of who I am as a Jew. It just doesn't make any sense to me. It, 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 they, they, those, those rubrics are very significant when you're talking about a religious philosophy. You ask me about my religious philosophy, I can talk to you about Reform, Conservative, and Orthodox. You talked about me as a Jew and my soul as a Jew, I've got to talk to you about more different things. The idea is that this institution should represent the range of things that make up the Jewish personality and the Jewish soul. One of the questions that Iris wanted me to ask you is, um, which is one of those questions where the answer's in the question, are you optimistic or pessimistic about where we are in the Jewish community? I want to ask that question differently. Mm -hmm. I have been, um, for most of my career, concerned about the Jewish community in that I feel similar to what you're saying in terms of the categorization, but I think the, the challenge to me is, is that I've always seen the Jewish community as finding ways to keep, keep people out, not finding ways to bring people in using the, the, great, the right words, continuity, identity, and all those kinds of things, but yet creating programs that by their very nature discourage people from entering or make it challenging or difficult for people outside the Jewish community, the organized Jewish community, for, from re-engaging. As you move forward with the philosophy you're talking about for American Jewish University, first of all, do you agree with what I'm saying? And two, if you agree, how, how is it entering into your thoughts about how this institution no, I, I do agree, but I, I think that a lot of people are coming to the same conclusion that you're coming to, Jay. I just attended a conference sponsored by the Jewish Week. Uh, it's the third year they've done it. It's called The Conversation. Right. I met many young Jewish artists and activists who are doing all kinds of things that I never heard of, which is good, because I'm more likely to hear about what the, if you will, established Jewish community is doing. But they're finding all different points of connection for people like themselves who couldn't find their way into the Jewish community. It goes back a little bit to the issue of this sort of reform, conservative, orthodox, the way we organize ourselves. When I was growing up, there were lots of non-synagogue ways to be a member of the Jewish community. And Jay, I really want to emphasize the word member because just to go to a class at HAU or just to go to a class somewhere else doesn't make you a member of something. I really think that it's very important that people consider themselves a member of something. You know, in other countries, very often one is a member of the, the Jewish community, and that has significance. It used to be that many, many people, let's say Hadassah, an organization like Hadassah, which is still a very strong organization, but in my mother's generation, it wasn't just something to which they paid dues. There were any number of women, my mother's age, for whom that was their ongoing Jewish activity that filled a lot of time for them. Now, Hadassah is still a great organization. There's still a lot of activists, but I don't think it's per as pervasive. And, uh, B'nai B'rith is another organization. When I was a kid, it's, it was much uh, broader based than it is now. That they're doing a lot of good things to try to reinstate that. What I'm saying is, is there not there need to be a lot of entry points into the Jewish community besides just the synagogues. And what I've noticed over the years is that's begun to shrink. Really, if you want an entry point, it's either going to be you're going to put up for for a synagogue membership, 
or if you've been really successful and you made a lot of money and you're charitably inclined, you can join any number of boards of organizations and you go to their dinners and you'll have a wonderful social connection because you'll meet all these same people that you'll see over and over again. But most Jews are not in that financial position and a lot of Jews are voting not to join synagogues the way they are right now, either because of the price tag that goes along with it or because they're not religiously inclined Jews and they don't quite see why that would be the place that they, they would join. So part of what an institution like this can also do is try to provide some kind of organization or group involving education and culture where Jews can, in addition to synagogues, or in ca some cases, it won't be a synagogue, it will be this, where they can feel that they can identify with the Jewish community. If you were going to give me a brief assessment of where you think the community is today in terms of identification, we're talking about membership, um, the state of, in your mind, what's the state of the union address for Jews? I think it's, it's uh, in some ways the best of times and the worst of times in that, uh, you know, assimilation continues. It would be foolish to say that there aren't larger numbers of Jews that are moving away. Uh, unlike the generation of my parents where people deliberately left Judaism, not my parents, but people their own, their, their own age, I think people are drifting away just because they're not being challenged to find anything significant in Judaism and because we live in a country that doesn't force this identity upon you if you don't, if you don't want to have it. So I suppose that might qualify as the worst of times. The best of times is that institutionally you have all kinds of programs and institutions growing. Look at this at this uh, hillside right here. You know, when we first moved here, we were the only Jewish institution. Then Stephen S. Wise uh, opened up. Then the uh, Milken School opened up. Then Skirball opened up. So er one by one, this has turned into a very significant area. But what it means is there's a lot of venues at which uh, people can begin to experience Jewish things. So on that level, particularly on the educational level, there are a lot more opportunities than there, than there used to be. And I find a lot of people are taking advantage of them. But one of the big changes in the, in, the, in the Jewish community, and I don't know how it's going to play out in the long time, when you look at what Jews actually do, ironically, and especially among young Jews, the ritual part of Judaism seems to be as widely observed as it ever was. Fasting on Yom Kippur, lighting Hanukkah candles, attending a Seder. That, that doesn't seem to be a tremendous drop-off among young Jews. Where you do see uh, a big change is how they feel about their connectedness to other Jews and the feeling of community. It's reflected very strongly in their attitudes towards Israel. Even though the attitudes towards Israel are still positive, they are much less so and much less strong than the attitudes that their parents and certainly their grandparents had uh, towards Israel. There's all kinds of explanations. They grew up post-48. They're influenced by what they read in the, in the media. But part of it is just less of a sense of ethnic connectivity to, to other Jews. Uh, you, you find the same thing, I think, in terms of when you ask them, is it more important to help Jews in need than others? Uh, most young Jews don't answer that, right. that that's, they're, not, they're not comfortable saying something like that because they feel it's really anti-humanistic that we should care about all, so all people. And, and, well, and, and maybe from their perspective, right. although I don't think that's where they're, where they're necessarily coming from. So I think we've not done a good job in terms of explaining to young Jews why you can be at the same time particularistic and universalistic, that you can have both of those things. And hopefully what you get from the particularism is the background and the sense of self that then can help you to contribute to the bigger picture. What we're hoping for Jews is not just that people who happen to be Jewish are doing wonderful things for the world, and that is a very important thing in and of itself, but that people who understand what it means to be Jewish, understand Jewish values, that it, because of what they understand about themselves, that they bring to the table, to the world table, something unique, a Jewish perspective. Sometimes it's an outsider perspective, sometimes it's a marginal perspective, but it's an important perspective that the world needs. If people cease to be knowledgeable about being Jewish, if they cease to identify as being Jews, then they're not going to have that, what I consider to be a unique gift to give to the world. And don't you, I mean, my frustration with the, all this is, on the one hand, you, you set the table correctly, but it feels to me like we're spending more resources institutionally in the Jewish world. We're raising more money. There are bigger and bigger institutions out there, and yet the, the, they don't seem to be addressing the, the core issues. But Jay, that's a very good point. And you know something? Some programs are good, and some programs aren't good. And that's, that's the simple answer. And what we have to become more sophisticated about as a community is to differentiate between good programs and not good programs. And we have to hold our, feet, our own feet to the fire, which means we have to evaluate 
what are the results of the program. You don't just throw money at something and hope it. I've, I've had this experience a few times with people who have launched large Jewish foundations. When I say large, I'm talking about hundreds of millions of dollars. And in my experience, each one of these mega donors initially begins to look for the silver bullet, right. that one program in the Jewish community that's going to turn everything around and, and, and reverse the tide of assimilation. And you know something? It doesn't exist. There isn't one program. But there are many programs. There are a whole variety of efforts when taken together can be very significant. I'll use the example that's used very, very often, which of course is the one of birthright, which was a very elegant and simple approach to dealing with one specific, well, really more than one specific issue. One issue was the relationship of young Jews to Israel, and the other, which was a corollary issue, was the relationship of young Jews to Judaism. And from everything that we can see preliminarily, this has been a very successful program. If nothing else, in the number of people who have, designed, you know, have, have gone on this program, I, I don't think that all of these Jews are going or just going because it's a free trip to Israel. That's not enough of a motivation, especially not for Jews growing up now. These kids get to go to all kinds of places. Right. But the fact that they're going means that all things being equal, they would like to know. They're curious about it. Much the same way that my good friend David Wolpe, Rabbi at Sinai Temple, has a program called Friday Night Live for single Jews. Seventeen or eighteen hundred single Jews come to that program once a month. Now you and I both know that the statistics are that many of those singles will ultimately not marry Jews. But what they're saying by going to this program is all things being equal, they care about being Jews. All things being equal, they'd like to find a Jewish spouse. And I have to assume the reason they want a Jewish spouse is because they want to ensure the continuity of the culture. The difference, of course, between them and their parents and grandparents is, is that if it doesn't work out, they will marry someone who is not Jewish, and they will do their best to maintain a Jewish home that way. In the previous generations, of course, that was a taboo, and they wouldn't have crossed that line. Absolutely. Let's go back to the, um, to the, the American Jewish University. I'm a senior, or I guess I'm, I'm the beginning, my senior year of high school, and I call you on the phone and I say, Dr. Wexler, why should I come to American Jewish University? What would your answer be? Well, I'd be very surprised if they got through to my office, but... Uh, well, they're an ingenious... Uh, I mean, yes, because yeah. we do have, especially, you know, <laughs> we are attracting Jewish students and they have been taught from an early age, always go to the top, and, right. and so I might get a call like that. Absolutely. And I would say, first of all, it's not for everybody. It absolutely is not for everybody. This is for uh, primarily young Jewish women and men, although it's not exclusively for, for Jews who are interested in a small, intimate environment where they will get a tremendous uh, connection, they will have a tremendous connection with their faculty, a lot of personal attention that they wouldn't get in, in almost any other kind of school that was larger than ours. In addition to that, they will get all of this in a Jewish ambiance, not a Jewish religious ambiance necessarily, but a Jewish cultural ambiance where part of their program will be the study of their own heritage. So it really doesn't matter whether they're taking pre-med or psychology or liberal studies, if they want to become a teacher, or whether they're going into business or any of the other majors that we have. Each one of them will do a certain number of units in Jewish civilization that will, because of where we are in American Judaism, probably catapult them into the top 10% of Jews in terms of their knowledge of their, own, of their own heritage. We also emphasize very strongly the ethical component of Judaism and values of Judaism as applied to the broader community because we expect from our graduates to be not only Jewish activists, activists in the Jewish community, but activists in the community uh, at large, inspired hopefully by the values that they learned with, uh, with us. So for someone who wants a small environment, somebody who wants individual attention, someone who likes the idea of being in a Jewish environment, this is an ideal place for them.